This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Good morning and welcome to Loose on the Lead for this Sunday Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everybody out there celebrating. Seth Merrill, look who's in the studio. It's Steve Bick. Happy Father's Day to my father, who we're going to see in a couple of hours. Nice. He's coming up. We're taking him to Jack's. And uh, it's also his 85th birthday this week. Oh, excellent. How about that? So uh, two for one. Absolutely. Two for one. And uh, Seth Merrill, Equidilly.com. Steve Bick of Sirius and XM's At the Races. Uh, back uh, in town after a week and a half down at Belmont Park, wrapping up Triple Crown coverage. And we'll touch on uh, Triple Crown wrap up. Obviously, some news right after the race, the rant by Steve Coburn, the double down the next day. And then last Monday, he was on Good Morning America and finally had the mea culpa. Uh, he and uh, partner um, Perry uh, accepted the uh, Kentucky Derby Trophy last night at Churchill Downs. Um, and, and according to the uh, AP report, um, uh, Coburn was, was gracious, but has not given up in his attempt to uh, have the Triple Crown rules changed and said he got a lot of support via email and, and tweets and whatnot. And he said uh, overwhelmingly it was in support. His idea, I can't believe there's anybody in support of this. If you uh, go in the Kentucky Derby, that, those are the only horses that can move on to the Preakness and the Belmont. That idea is absurd to me. If you want to lengthen it, you can discuss that. I think that's wrong, too. But I think uh, since Coburn came out with this and some of the mainstream media picked up on it and said, yeah, maybe he's got a point. There are some other, some horse racing medias have come out with the actual statistics. And you realize that there historically it's just a, a goofy idea other horses have ha been on the same path he has it hasn't changed in the favor of the new shooters really in the in the past few years percentage wise and whatnot so it's just kind of a goofy idea but again uh, they say he was gracious in accepting the kentucky derby trophy last night so that's kept things in the news certainly for a few more days but i think overall triple crown was just the triple, triple crown attempt was great for racing and i think that was demonstrated by the handle at belmont uh, on Belmont Stakes Day, and the fact that, and I brought it up earlier this week on television, the Belmont Stakes, the television broadcast, the numbers were very good, but more notable, it was the most watched program of the week. That included primetime broadcast uh, programming as well. So I think it, it all bore out to say that the, the uh, Triple Crown attempt, we didn't get it, it was a disappointment from that point standpoint, but overall I think it was a positive for racing. Uh, there's no doubt, and all the all the post-mortems that have been involved uh, from the people that we've had on the radio this week, uh, everybody agreed that it, it was a special five weeks, and that in itself should be a signal and notable, the five weeks. I mean, the intensity of this is a big portion of why the Triple Crown became the focal point that it's become. Coburn's notion and his posturing and everything else is just ridiculous and uh, in fact one of the guests we considered for today we couldn't get to Steve Nagler uh, the longtime broadcast uh, executive and Steve is over in England for Royal Ascot this week we'll talk about Ascot in a little bit but I, I broached a topic with Nagler uh, about whether NBC in fact in some ways engineered this uh, they, they had to know that the potential for a, a guy like Steve Coburn was a, you know, was a reality TV moment in the making. And I, and I would even be curious to know if, in light of his acknowledgement about the things he said in Baltimore about Churchill, you know, he came out uh, subsequently also and acknowledged that, you know, he'd been he'd been uh, in, into the sauce and, and so forth. And I really get the feeling that NBC was relishing the opportunity for, for something untoward and something preposterous from a guy who they had clearly established was a, a free shooter and a, and a hip shooter. And if that's the case, I, I, 
even though the long range elements of this have been largely okay and have kept the ball in the air and it's been the fodder for late night talk show hosts, I don't like the concept or even the notion that the network may very well have been laying in wait for just this kind of a meltdown, uh, especially because the industry is paying NBC and Fox, you know, they're sending a lot of money in their direction, you know, for this added coverage. And if, if they were relishing an opportunity for an embarrassing moment, something that was, you know, I, there's a couple of parts of this that I find kind of funny. Uh, the, the Coburn thing is played up over and over again. I, I got to say that a guy that really doesn't know much about the game, okay, he can say these kind of silly things. Barry Irwin's embarrassing moment after a race, after the Kentucky Derby, when Leroy Animo, to me, that was much more insulting and, and outlandish. And I'm surprised that that moment hasn't been brought out more, trotted out more widely in this kind of a discussion. But I, I, don't, I don't like the idea that the network thought that th this was some uh, perfect opportunity uh, for, you know, a, a situation that you know, that could turn into what it turned into. Yeah, and, and obviously, if you're a television network, you're waiting for those kind of moments because they yeah. make news. And, and you know, I, I think... Not in, the, not in this sport, yet it's not. And, you know, especially in light of somebody like Eugene Melnick retiring from racing this week, the, the game has a, a gentility, and whether you appreciate it or not, I mean, the, the juxtaposition was Costas feeling obliged to ask Robert Evans, do you have any comment? Of course Robert Evans doesn't have any comment. Robert Evans is above commenting on something as, as outlandish and just, just sideshow-esque as a, as a Steve Coburn. I mean, that's what, that's what is really bothersome about this. It, it, it's not, you know, then people say, oh, racing can use more WWE-esque moments. No, no, it can't. And no, it, it doesn't need them. And it, it's not really what the, the game is about. Uh, it's about uh, gentlemanly conduct. And it, it's about being gracious in defeat as you are in victory. And, and that also means your horse is available to take on all comers. And that's obviously lost on some, uh, you know, avant-garde or, or nouveau owner like uh, Steve Coburn, uh, who deserves folk status, uh, uh, I mean, about as little as, as can be possibly imagined. And uh, there was an article, and I've forgotten where I read it now, but kind of the flip side of the coin of Ed Stanko uh, running down Bill Mott after the race and congratulating on the victory of close hatches. And also Mr. Hughes uh, reaching out to B. Wayne Hughes and congratulating Hughes and looking forward to the next opportunity, or uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Judmont and, and uh, Garrett O'Rourke, but uh, also, uh, you know, extending uh, a, a nice... Uh, you know, appreciation to B. Wayne Hughes for coming east when he, you know, when they, you know that Richard Mandela had really no interest really in doing this. I mean, he much prefer to keep uh, a filly like this at home and run, you know, right out of their own stalls at Santa Anita rather than come traipse across the country. But B. Wayne Hughes wanted Beholder to be engaged in this because it was a great opportunity and great for the sport, the same way Stanko felt that it was appropriate that Princess Asilmar travel to California last year for Breeders' Cup. That, that spirit of competition is what the sport is based on. The game, if you go back to its origins, it goes back to basically masters you know, having, their, having their stable boys uh, you know, basically lifted up on horses and, and pairing off against, you know, against the, the, you know, the farmer down the street or, uh, you know, the master down the block. Uh, I just, I found this whole episode just completely unnecessary. And, and then, you know, the, the debate, uh, the debate that's coming out of, when you mentioned the Triple Crown and the dates, again, something that is, is completely inappropriate, unnecessary, and directed by, in essence, 
a, a phony agenda. I, I mean, Tom Chukas uh, basically saying in the Maryland Jockey Club, oh, we need to change the dates, uh, ostensibly because he doesn't like the fact that uh, the Preakness undercard isn't drawing the way uh, they'd like it because it's two weeks after the Derby and there's big purses available at the Derby and there's big purses available at uh, Belmont three weeks later. That's not Belmont's fault. That's not Churchill's fault. Maryland Jockey Club had their opportunity to right their ship. They, they basically have stabilized things, but when Frank Stronach didn't pay the $26 million to throw the hat in the ring for those, you know, for the casinos in Maryland, and it ended up going down to Anne Arundel County, down to the Arundel Mills instead of the Laurel, they, they're the ones who made their own bed. And so now we're going to throw out the most marketable thing we've got in the sport, the Triple Crown, because the Maryland Jockey Club wants bigger fields for the Dixie. Sorry, not a priority. Yeah, and, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, you look at the, the uh, TV ratings and, and just the mainstream media coverage for uh, the Triple Crown this year. How can you make an argument that it's, it's broken yeah. uh, off of the numbers they did this year? I mean, exactly. I think, uh, you see this Ridiculous. and you say the five-week uh, period is just right and really attracts the attention that it should attract. You mentioned uh, Beholder, should mention that she came out of it with a little ding. Commissioner has come out with a little ding. And a couple of uh, bad news uh, notes, obviously, over the past week. Intense holiday, euthanized uh, with laminitis, suffering from laminitis, and commendable over in Korea, the 2000 Belmont Stakes winner was euthanized as well, so some bad Yeah, news. tough, uh, happened to have seen Jack Wolf on Thursday before the Belmont and asked how intense holiday, how the surgery went, and he said surgery was okay. He said, but uh, now there's an infection, and uh, right away uh, things just went from, from bad to worse to fatal, felt terrible. There's also a story that uh, you're gonna hear from, uh, if you haven't seen it already, uh, on uh, Twitter and so forth. Uh, we'll talk to Jenny Reese at the bottom of the hour at Churchill Downs this morning. Social bug, Bob Baffert's Philly, that is a uh, sister, half-sister of Midnight Loot. Social bug went wrong this morning and Rosina Pravnik went down with her, uh, has got a shoulder injury. She's uh, clearly banged up and she's going to miss time. So there's been no shortage of, uh, of uh, some tough uh, pieces of news. Uh, you mentioned Commissioner, just a little ankle, a little chip out of the ankle, 90 days. He'll be back for the later portion of the year. but. Uh, very tough. Uh, it's always hard when, when you know, the thing with the tense holiday. I mean, it goes from, it goes from Derby buzz horse to, you know, Belmont hopeful to injured to retired to dead. Uh, in five weeks. And, and it's the perfect example of how quirky that equine physiology is. It's just when they get injured, it's always, a, you got to keep your fingers crossed because you just never know when it can go south like that. All right, why don't we take our first break. When we come back, we'll take a look at a couple of replays and a little later on, Churchill replays as well with Jenny Reese. The one more, Bel the one more Belmont story? Okay. The, the situation that went on uh, in, in the holding barn pre-race uh, and uh, Mike Maker, who has done this before, arrived like right at the 11th hour. I mean, virtually, uh, you know, exactly at the last moment and creating a, a, an atmosphere of tension, uh, you know, in the in the assembly barn. And then the subsequent uh, near fight between he and, and Dale Romans. I mean, Dale Romans was furious. And the people who were around Maker a lot complained that this is not a new phenomenon. Oh, we didn't know what time, and oh, the staff held us up, and it's always some excuse. And for those that are saying, well, what's the big deal? He got there, you know, right under the wire. The big deal, and Dale Romans uh, talked about it with me on the radio, the big deal is what happens if, if General A-Rod wins the race? What if he's second in the race, and then subsequently people find out, oh, he didn't get to the holding barn, to the assembly barn, uh, you know, right at the 11th hour. I mean, everybody else had been there and, and were, were ready to go, you know, when they were going to walk over. And Dale Romans has a great point. He opened up the industry, and to those that are just waiting to critique a situation like this, he opened up everybody to, you know, potential embarrassment. 
and good for Dale Romans for bringing it up. And then, uh, of course, some people start taking shots at Dale because, you know, apparently uh, he used some, uh, some foul language uh, in front of children. Uh, and I'm sure Dale's sorry about that. But uh, clearly Mike Maker's not sorry about, you know, this kind of activity because he's done it before. And, you know, we're in a situation where everything is under scrutiny and everybody has to be attentive and take care of, of these kinds of things and, and be, you know, where they're supposed to be on time and, and follow these rules to the letter. And, uh, you know, this was, this sort of went under the Coburn thing became the, the controversy. This was a much bigger story, really, and, and potentially a, a problem, a giant problem. And the follow-up in the Blood Horse, uh, they talked to Martin Panza and they said, well, gee, no rules were really broken. And then the last couple of paragraphs, it says, while a rule might not have been broken in connection with the incident, Panza said stewards may decide to fine Maker for not making the test barn deadline. Well, how do you get fined if you didn't break a rule? <laughs> seems like seems like if they're looking and they they, they they may have decided if they're going to find him they may have decided there was a rule broken there it's a dicey situation all right let's take our break when we come back as i said we'll take a look at some uh, replays and much more right after this The future of online betting is here and only at the all new capitalotbbet.com CapitalOTBBet.com delivers a state-of-the-art wagering experience found nowhere else in horse racing. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Go Zephyr kicking clear, and Go Zephyr is pulling away impressively. It's the Rick Lady Ginger Punch, Ginger Punch to win it. And it's Wilco in front, and he's going to pull off a huge upset here. But it's Round Pond going on to take the distaff. Awesome again. Sar of 10 Grade 1 winners, four Breeders' Cup champions, and four multi-millionaires standing at Adina Springs. It's more than just a sports bar. It's Stadium Cafe. Located at 389 Broadway in Saratoga, it's the place to be for great times and great food. Their menu features everything from gourmet entrees to your favorite wraps and sandwiches. Or maybe you just want to grab a beer and catch the game. So what can be better than that? How about two stadium cafes? There's also the West Side Stadium, right up the road at 112 Congress Street. Same great menu, same great service. Whether you're hanging at the bar or just relaxing outside on their spacious covered patio, you'll always leave knowing you'll be back again. We love, above all, the staff. We love Dave Harmon, and the food is fantastic. Not one, but two. 112 Congress Street, 389 Broadway. Guaranteed to be a home run. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Loose on the Lead for this Sunday morning. Seth Merrow and Steve Bick. And before we get into replays, we were talking during the break. You guys had Toy Cannon run yesterday. And I said to you, top of the stretch, I thought he was going to get swallowed up. Then he kind of re-engaged. And I thought yeah, any second he'd fire and go right by him. And just didn't get that, that total move and winds up running a decent third yesterday. Uh, he's, he's, he's constantly picking up checks. It'd be nice to get a, you know, that elusive second win. But, uh, hey. Second start of the year as a five-year-old. I don't think he loved the soft going. And, you know, even though I think they were calling it yielding yesterday, did you look at the times of those turf races? I, he, he ran two weeks ago on the firm turf. They go a mile in 134 and change. Yesterday, 137 and change. So that was a pretty heavy turf course yesterday. And, I, and I, I, you know, John Hurtler's, Hurtler's going great. And Hurtler won this race and, you know, rallying up inside. And I think the, I think the closer you were to the, this was on the widener, I think the closer you were to the inside uh, and to the rail, I think that may have been a little better footing because uh, something tells me this is the second time for Toy Cannon on softish going. And, and he, neither time he really had that, that good finish that we expect. But at the same time, there wasn't going to be a pace and so Alvarado kept him a little closer, I think. 
And yeah, he, didn't, he was he right didn't up have, with the He pace. didn't have his usual finish. Uh, he's a funny horse. I, there's a win in there somewhere. There's a New York Bread Allowance win, uh, I think, uh, at some point. Yeah, he sure. Hopefully Saratoga. That'd yeah, be all right. As, as you say, he's been collecting some checks for you. So we'll up keep to 90,000 in earnings. Toy, toy cannon. And the race just before that yesterday, interesting, the Astoria. Uh, these are, were uh, two-year-olds, uh, two-year-old fillies. Um, $100,000 on the line this going five and effort. a half. And it is a Pletcher first-time starter. I said on the handicappers report, that's, we're looking for the number six here, Fashion Alert. First-time starter by Old Fashion from Pletcher. John Velasquez on board. But I said earlier on the handicappers report, <laughs> it is, oh, what was that? It is, it is, it is, it is not your father's uh, two-year-old stakes action anymore because uh, the, you know, the first-time starter gets it done for $100,000. Uh, fashion alert. And again, it was a very nice performance. Second choice, uh, the top choice, uh, Leat Leatris, uh, eight to five. Uh, Pletcher's horse was nine to five, the second choice in here. There it is. Um, but gets it done. As, there we go. Again, the, uh, the first time starter, as I say, a little bit different. I think, yeah, everybody else in the field had at least one start. They all had only one start. So it's a little bit different these days. $100,000 on the line, first time starter. But she did it in such a fashion that certainly uh, this will be a player up in the uh, stakes. You would have to think it's Saratoga. 87 buyer uh, for her. And what's interesting is I'm surprised that she didn't go off as the favorite. They made that Leatrice uh, the favorite. And fashion alert, if you look uh, at, her, at her pedigree, you would notice right away she's a half-sister to Renee's Titan. And Renee's Titans, a great at stake winner out in California. I think uh, I want to say Doug O'Neill. I think O'Neill. And uh, Renee's Titan was fast as a two year old as well. So I'm a little surprised that uh, the Pletcher Philly did not go favored. A uh, little, little odd that uh, a horse from uh, Jean Anderson ends up, uh, you know, being favored here coming up from, coming up from uh, Laurel. But uh, this is an impressive performance, never really asked by uh, Johnny Velasquez. Fashion alert, and uh, obviously, 87 buyer in the debut. This is a uh, this is a run in Philly. Hey, and speaking of obviously, let's shift our attention now. But I'm to, uh, <laughs> Hey now. Uh, Sienna Anita Park, the Shoemaker Mile yesterday, Grade One for $400,000 going a mile on the turf. And uh, the eight to five favorite was obviously, and obviously gets it done in a repeat performance. Won this race last year. Kind of ended the 2013 season going the wrong way. A fourth in the uh, City of Hope, and then in the Breeders' Cup mile winds up fifth. But the seasonal debut this year in the American won that nicely at a mile on the uh, turf at Santa Anita. Follows it up yesterday and gets it done uh, pretty nicely. So obviously, uh, as I say, goes off as the eight to five favorite and wins the number one horse here. The one that I found interesting was the number two, Jack Milton, coming in for Pletcher, brought uh, uh, Javier Castellano across country. And that one to me just seemed to maybe turn the corner in the poker last time. So I thought Jack Milton was gonna be a little bit interesting, but kind of disappoints running fifth in here as the five to two second choice. Well, I, I, what, a couple things to note here. What was, Pulpit's Express was here for one reason to be a rabbit. I mean, to basically engage, obviously, and uh, Drayden Van Dyke can't even get him to the lead, can't even get him to engage the winner. So that he was here to basically support Jack Milton. Gary Barber owns both. And so that plan didn't work. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in the meantime, Chris Clement uh, with another grade one Placing uh, summer, front. summer front, a yeah. nice performance, and uh, obviously uh, rolling along. Phil D'Amato, of course, uh, part of the story, having uh, taken over uh, the Mike Mitchell barn. Mike Mitchell officially having retired. Uh, and then, of course, you turn your attention. We're not going to watch it, but then uh, half an hour later, the grade one vanity, uh, a race that Zenyatta, of course, won 11 times. And, uh, oh, wait, not 11, I'm sorry, just three yeah. or four. Uh, the vanity, Ayatapa, and Ayatapa for John Sadler, also not just wire to wire, but uh, uh, wins by 10. I mean, just ran off if you saw this race. Grace Hall was chasing and had no answer when Ayatapa, uh, Joe Talamo, who won both of the grade ones yesterday, 
uh, accelerated on Ayatapa, uh, off she went. And so Bill Mott, who had sent Grace Hall out uh, to California and who people sent off as the two to one favorite, uh, she was a distant second in here. Ayatapa, part of a, a, an amazing eight days, Seth. How about the fact that since last Friday, when Palace won the True North, and then Kid Cruz wins the Easy Goer, then Ayatapa wins the Vanity, and then hours later, the win by Moonshine Mullen in the Stephen Foster. The commonality? Well, uh, I'm looking at Ayatapa. That's the only one I don't know. The other three were all claimed. So was Ayatapa. <laughs> Ayatapa was a $50,000 claim out of her first career start. $50,000 a course as well for Kid Cruz, $20,000 for Palace, $40,000 for Moonshine Mullen. $160,000, two grade one winners, a grade two winner, and a listed stake winner with upside yet with Kid Cruz. What a game. You, you, don't, you don't have to breed. You, you just have to be aggressive and put some partners together and you know, be unafraid to reach in and, and try. I mean, listen, not every, not every claim is going to turn into a graded stake winner. Of course, there's the downside of that, uh, too. There's the people who they would claim from where you got to be ready to. But the Kid Cruz people, at least. Uh, they bought back yeah, in. They got, they got back in. Well, you know, the thing about. You know, people say, oh, the people that the, the horse got taken from. Well, that's, a, that's one of those things. I mean, it's a calculated gamble. Yeah, it's a risk. And you know, typically, you drop a horse in to a spot where you think they can win, and you say to yourself, if we win the race, we get the purse, and we get claimed, you know, we make 90000 80000 60000 50000 whatever it is. And at the time, that's the decision you make. And when it comes to maiden claimers, that's a little different because you're, you know, you, you've got a basic evaluation of the horse's potential, but you don't know. You, I mean, certainly Ayatapa being dangled for 50, don't forget, it also depends on what you paid for the horse. If it's, if it's a horse you bred, yeah, maybe you paid 10,000 for the, for the stud fee and yeah, maybe you got 30,000 in and you run them for maiden 50. It's very reasonable. And you just think, all right, if somebody wants to claim him or her, God bless him. Good luck to them. It gets me out. Hopefully we win. And if it's a $50,000 purse, there's 80000 So technically you've quadrupled or tripled your money. So that's the kind of equation it is. But then, I still, I still think $800,000 down the road, you're probably, you're No, probably I hear not. you. I know, I know, I know. But it's, it's just, it's one, of those, it's one of those things, particularly with Phillies. I mean, this Ayatapa, I mean, for her to have done now what she's done, yeah, to become a, a grade one winner. Uh, it, it's, it, how do you, you know, she's, and, and I think she's got multiple grade two, right, she's got the grade two, uh, grade two Santa, Mar, uh, Santa Maria, and uh, she was multiple grade, uh, grade one placed coming in. So uh, it, that, it's been one of those great stories. I, I love that. Uh, to me, it's oh, absolutely. Uh, Lava Man. You go back. I mean, Lava there have Man. been some great ones over the years. Uh, let's touch on something we didn't touch on at the top of the show uh, before we go to the break, and that's just uh, some news coming out that you know, in light of again those big numbers coming out of the Triple Crown, there are some more disturbing news overall in the racing industry. Suffolk Downs is cutting dates. Mountaineer is lo looking to cut dates. Uh, Colonial is still in a kind of a holding pattern. Although I would think in the next couple of days. That's got to be firmed up. Thursday, there'll be a, there, there's supposed to be another. They tried a conference call on Friday, didn't get anywhere. They will have one more potential meeting on Thursday in a last ditch they, they, effort. Yeah, they've already gone past a couple of oh, drop they, dead it's, dates. It's, it would be an at this point, it would be a very yeah, abbreviated meet. Um, but it's a it's a tough situation. Although at the same time, Delaware is the oh, distinct yeah. beneficiary. And I think Monmouth as well will pick yeah. up some. They were so showing some Maryland runners today. And then also Arlington cutting purses in response to handle. And I think a lot of this is due to something we've talked about over the past couple of years, and that was the shrinking of the fall crop. And, and you've seen this spring. I think you've seen at Belmont a couple of very short three horse fields. You saw a match race essentially after scratches at Churchill Downs a couple of weeks ago early in their card. Uh, the stakes race out in Southern California a couple of weeks ago after scratches was down to three horses. And I think, it, you know, that is now coming home to roost. And with the, the uh, auction market kind of rebounding, maybe this 
full crop will expand over the next few years. But I think in the near future, in the near term, we're, we're going to be looking at a little more of this happening. It's just a, a function of short fields, small purses. You know, nobody likes that. And so I, th I think the, the racing industry will have to, you know, face this now for, as I say, at least a couple more years. Well, in Arlington, uh, you don't know how much of that uh, handle situation at Arlington is the is a response to the synthetic. I mean, it could be at this point that you know people have completely turned their back too on the synthetic uh, track uh, element. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest; I haven't looked at Arlington uh, at all since they opened. You know, they used to open on Father's Day. So, I mean, in some, in some cases, that used to be, Father's Day was a big thing at, at Arlington. Some of this, you know, is, you know, is maybe the pendulum swinging back in terms of what had been, you know, an oversaturation. And, you know, the horsemen, you got to put the, a little bit of this blame on the horsemen, you know, who pushed for you know, more dates. Uh, you know, on the flip side, there are regions, look what's going to, you know, Florida, there's going to be a, a, a better, uh, it looks like the resolution is set in Florida between Calder and, and Gulfstream, so you'll have, a, you know, a, a, some order prevailing uh, down there. It's the situation in Massachusetts, that's a strange scenario, I mean, because you really get the feeling that the only reason Richard Fields and Chip Tuttle ever got involved there was for the casino. And uh, they've even, they even, as part of a response to the state, to the gaming commission, uh, to the evaluating on the, uh, on the casino, even told them uh, that if uh, it was a question of, if it was a question of uh, racing versus the, the slot license, that they would give up racing if, if they had to. Although they backtracked on that. I, of course they did, but, but I mean, they, they, because it, they had made every promise already to the, to the state previously. And, and to the community. So, uh, they, you know, some of this, uh, you know, they're, they're, you're at a point where uh, abbreviated dates and, and a better concentration is, and less overlap would be to the benefit of everybody. There's no doubt. I mean, there's days where I pull up cards and, you know, the 29 racetracks running the same day. Uh, you know, it's blood from a stone at a certain point. Yeah, and so uh, again, the, the racing industry will have to face this over the next couple of years and make some so, tough decisions at some of these racetracks. Anything else you want to touch on before we hit the uh, break? You know, we uh, the one stake we mentioned. There's the Colonial, so I, we can put the Colonial away, and uh, we'll mention also. Uh, speaking of Delaware, pretty nice group actually for the Obeya, yeah. uh, which ended up with a, a field of eight and Gamay Noir. Uh, backed up some of her form from this past uh, winter for uh, Marty Wolfson and Chasing Tail Stable. Gamay Noir with a nice performance here back to the race she ran in the Rampart. So she wins the, uh, she wins the Obeya. I don't know if she can compete with Close Hatches and Princess of Silmar uh, later in the month, but uh, she got, a, I think, a low 90s buyer. So a solid uh, Solid effort. Centino on board. He's having a nice meet there. That was a good ride, too. He came, he came from out of the clouds, considering that the pace was very slow in that race. And Monta I, th I thought uh, mid-stretch, I thought here's Chris Clement is going to win another main track stake with Montana Native. She had no excuse. I'll tell you who did not run well in there. I, uh, I bet uh, uh, flashing uh, flash forward a little bit, and she didn't run. I, 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 I thought Chatino uh, went down there with a purpose with the uh, – a flash forward. She ended up fifth and never really mounted much of a challenge. Yeah. But uh, again, that's the prep for uh, the Delaware Handicap, the local prep. All right, we'll head to our next break. When we come back, Jenny Reese, Louisville Courier Journal, talk a little Churchill down stakes from Saturday night right after this. I'm Seth Merrill. Join me weekdays at 10 for Racing Across America. We'll look at important races from around the country, get insight from top handicappers and analysts, and preview the upcoming week in racing. That's Racing Across America, weekdays at 10, right here on the OTB TV network. Fascinated by the world of horse racing? Interested in honing your handicapping skills? Class is in session. Night school, Monday nights. Easy to access online. It's free, interactive, and informative for the casual and serious race fan. Horse player now buzz. Live horses to watch email to you daily. Our eyes, your prize. Night school in the buzz. Visit horseplayernow.com for details. The Capital OTB Handicapping Challenge Series is back. 
That's right. The 2014 Capital OTB Handicapping Challenge Series is back, and it's your chance to win thousands in cash and prizes, and a seat at the 2015 Handicapping Championship in Las Vegas. This month's contest is the Firecracker on July 12th. So sign up today, online at CapitalOTB.com, or stop in at the Clubhouse Racebook. I didn't want to get just any degree after high school. Horse racing has always been my passion. I was already a lawyer. When I was young, my dad took me to the races. The sound of the crowd, I still remember. I'm 40, and I don't want to stay in a career I don't love. I want to follow my passion. Follow your passion at the University of Arizona Racetrack Industry Program. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Welcome back to Loose on the Lead. Seth Merrill and Steve Bick in the studio and live via phone from Churchill Downs. Jenny Reese of the Louisville Courier-Journal. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, guys. Obviously, it was a big night last night. I just wanted a little overview of what it was like it was one of those downs after dark nights and i was watching the simulcast and between races they were interviewing people uh one of the lucky customers had a thousand dollar win bet on tapature and the mat win and it sounded like everybody was having a very good time a very good time but i'm just wondering what uh, what the crowd was like last night yeah i think it, everybody was having a good time i still have mixed feelings it's, it's really cool after those stakes wins looking up and having this big crowd watching, but there's also a big crowd out back listening to a band. And part of me thinks, let's save the two and the three horse races for the night racing because they don't know the difference. <laughs> and then let's have the grade one Stephen Foster in the afternoon where the racing fans can all come out and enjoy it. So I still have mixed feelings about them having so many of their big races lumped together at a time when half the uh, uh, you know, the crowd probably has no idea who's even running. Well, we knew certainly who was running in the features, and uh, before uh, we talk about some of the other, the other elements of the night, let's go right to the grade one, because it's a wonderful story, Jenny. Randy Morse, a guy that I've gotten to know uh, with a few different you know, good second-tier uh, stake horses, mm -hmm. this, though, is a wonderful story. To see a guy like this win the Stephen Foster with a $40,000 claim yeah. rate, a horse that he has crafted into a very dangerous machine. And he did figure to sit off a Jaguar paw and be the leader at the top of the stretch. And Calvin Burrell absolutely rode him to a T. He did, and it, and it, it didn't hurt him that we'll take charge. Uh, Gary Stevens saying he didn't seem like he really handled Jack the first part, and he was eighth. You know, and it was a pretty soft pace. Um, and he was eighth until sort of midway through the turn, and if I just had, you know, too little, too late, uh, was coming on, you know, you think he's a real mile and a quarter horse, and he certainly could be a factor in, you know, the other races the rest of the year. It's good to see him. Mean, much better effort than in the Ali Sheba, also won by Moonshine Mullen, but when we'll take charge with six. But uh, it's interesting because it was a win in your in race for Moonshine Mullen for the Breeders' Cup Classic, but it was also a win in your in race, basically, for the Japan Cup dirt. The members of, well, they don't call it that anymore. They call it the Champions Cup, I think now. Member of the members of the Japan Racing Association were by the barn, uh, you know, this morning talking to Randy and about how uh, I think that race is a couple million dollars and they pay your expenses and uh, I think it's a three thousand dollar declaration, but they get two plane tickets to Japan for the trainer, two for the owners, you know, pay for your horse's transportation and all that. Pretty nice deal. And he was, you know, Randy went twice with more like a, a horse he claimed for fifty, maybe was it? Um, a sprinter that twice got beat ahead in, in Hong Kong um, by uh, Favor, Favor, um, you all, Steve, you'd know the horse, um, the Australian sprinter. Uh, but, uh, take over but anyway, time. so, you know, they're very realistic. This horse is a horse, actually. He's not a gelding, but his pedigree is such. He's by Albert the Great that there's no rush to, you know, for his stud farms, and they're looking at making money with him. So it's a sure thing that the Breeders' Cup is the way they would go. Uh, it'll be interesting to see their next race. Randy says they're going to go to Saratoga, but they're not interested in running against Palace Malice. And, you know, the other thing is, this horse, 
he's also eligible for the claiming crown. And how how prohibitive a favorite would he be in for that? But I was talking to Steve Atkinson this morning for a couple reasons. Um, but I asked if he was the horse, he was the trainer uh, that Randy Morse claimed the horse off for 40. But having said that, they don't, he only had him and Maggie Moss as the owner for a few races. They claimed him for 25, and they did what you're supposed to do when you claim a horse for 25. They did raise him. They won a race. I think they ran him for like 50 or something, and, and he didn't run that, you know, great. So they put him in for the 40. Uh, they lost him. They made a profit on the horse. They were happy. And one component is, and, you know, Steve said that, you know, Randy's done a terrific job with the horse. I said, did you, could, you said, yeah, we could have claimed them back twice for 40. I said, did you think about it? He said, yeah, we talked about it. We just never pulled the trigger. He said, but part of that is, you claim a horse for 40, what do you do with him next? You know, he said, you don't expect the 80,000 claiming races to necessarily go. He said, and you certainly wouldn't claim them to run against we'll take charge. You know, you wouldn't think at the time. But he's, you know, morphed into this really nice horse. And uh, good for them. You know, first grade one for um, for Randy Morrison, also owner of uh, Randy Patterson, who had, you know, his first grade two was the Ali Sheba with him. Well, and of course, Randy Morris, the horse that I always think of with him, and I talked to him so many times when uh, Jonesboro was... Yes, there. We're here. Can you not... She can't hear us? Guys? We'll... we'll uh reach out and, and uh they'll try to get uh, that reconnected but uh jonesboro was the son of mom's command and it, it, there's obviously i want to ask i want to ask jenny this because it's obvious now she's back i was just talking about randy morse and jonesboro jenny because jonesboro was a horse that as he got older maintained his form to age what six seven eight and yeah, so, so he had him around forever. Right, and, and so clearly, it, it, this is very interesting to me, and I'm looking forward to talking to, to Randy again tomorrow on radio, because Albert the Great has not been a big sire. However, the horses of his that have done well have done well when they've become fully mature at five and six. This horse, when he was with Reed Baker and he came to, one of the reasons they want to come to Saratoga, he was second in the Jim Dandy, Dandy right. at 30 to one. 2011. You bet. And, and, I, and this was always a horse that was cut out to be a nice one. And he, you know, he obviously meandered. He never really you know, completely lost form. So it, it's really not surprising that, that there was this potential in there to get him honed like this. But tell everybody about Randy Morse, who's a real, you know, real old-fashioned, hard-boot type horseman. Yeah, I don't know if we'd call him a hard boot. Aren't there, you think them more being kind of connected to Lexington, right? But he is a he's oh, uh, definitely a he's you know, Midwest horseman, and he was around Kentucky for a long time. Then he left for a few years, and he's yeah. been back a few years now. And his stable's you know bigger than ever. I think he's got like a Prairie Meadows string, and he's got an yeah. Indiana Down string, which is a good thing to have these days with their purses. And uh, you know he's doing great. And and this is you know he was just hoping to have a horse that you could. Uh, um, you know, run for you know forty, fifty thousand dollars at Oakland, and with those big pots, and you know, cash a couple, you know, uh, get a couple big purses. And uh, you know, I asked uh, the owner. This was the day before. I was fortuitous enough to happen to run into them. The owner happened to be there. I said, "Well, what were you uh, hoping to get when uh, y'all claimed this horse?" He goes, "Lucky." <laughs> so <laughs> mission accomplished there. I would say for sure. Um, It'll be interesting to see where they go next. Like I said, they're not really look, they're not built to try to make them a stallion because I think that you know, this, like you make a good point about the Albert the Greats when they get to you know five and six, but he's not commercially fashionable. Uh, so they they're gonna you know they're gonna put him in spots where he can succeed as clearly they have been. Uh, he, Randy did tell me that the one if you look him back, the only thing he really second guesses is he said he probably should have run him in the Oakland Handicap. Um, because his allowance win uh, before was, uh, or I guess it was the same, maybe it was the same day, or but the race before had been really good. Um, and so that was, you know, kind of interesting, but they waited to the alley Sheba. And he said last night that it wasn't a fluke. Um, but uh, it, it was, uh, you know, and I thought we'll take charge, you know, not as a race, but still a very good race. Uh, and I don't know what to make from Long River. He was kind of the wise guy horse going in. Uh, and what he finished like 
sixth or something like that. Yeah, seventh. He stunk. Yeah. He, the, you, you can go ahead and say it. He was a he was an embarrassment, actually. I mean, considering. Well, I, I didn't want to say that he was one of those overhyped New York horses. But... He stunk. <laughs> they're, they're, don't be shy. Look at his form. I'm like, what am I missing here? No. I said, I guess I don't follow the sheets. You know? No, there was but, nothing there. He, he certainly stunk. had. I mean, with that pedigree, you know, he has a license to be a nice horse. And I remember when he was a young horse. Uh, Karen talking about him thinking he'd be a good horse, you know, on down the road, and maybe it's just going to be a little farther down the road. But but I do want to tell you about one thing. Uh, you know, speaking of Steve Ashbison, and, you know, he, he had in that um, optional 80 race, he had Saber Cat, who mm. ran in the Derby a couple of years ago. Oh, and on the far turn, I didn't see what happened at first, but I see these hind legs going up. I thought the horse had broken a hind leg. And then, you know, we find out that. No, he's fine. And so what happened? I didn't realize he fell twice. He clipped heels and went down. And when he went down, his dirt slipped, and then he popped back up. But it was like a, bron- uh, a bucking strap or something down his flank. So he started bucking. And then he ended up going down again. And, um, you know, Ricardo said, I'm not sure if it was the first or the second time that Ricardo came off. Um, but he seems to be okay. Um, I'm not sure if he's riding today or not. He was complaining of a headache that he walked off. Uh, but the good news is Saber Cat, he, you know, he has little, or he, you know, nicked himself uh, when he clipped heels uh, on his hoof, but he seems okay. And then uh, two races later, Passature wins for the exact same connection. So, you know, it goes from you having a smile on your face that the horse is okay, considering that he was, you know, vanned off, uh, to then your, um, you know, your derby horse, uh, runs very well, and, and uh, they're looking maybe at pointing towards a race like the West Virginia Derby with Tapture. I think they're going to be, you know, maybe sort of the departing course. Um, and departing, speaking of in the Stephen Foster, he ran well, just beating, what, a head or a neck for for second, and, you know, second race off the layoff, and he ought to be tougher next time. And he's a horse who trained very well, and I think he's a horse that's got a, you know, a big win in him at some point. I think we're going to look back at the Stephen Foster and say there were some really nice horses in there. Well, and of course, you mentioned Tapature coming back, and, and this, you know, there's so many horses over the years out of the Asmussen barn that take on this role, Sabercat being one of them, but also a horse like Zaniero. Uh, the, you know, the, That's exactly who he mentioned. Zaniero had been fit second in the same race, the Matt Wynn, might have been called the Northern Dancer at the time, and then came back and won the West Virginia Derby, which Asmussen's won like five times. It was a $750,000 yeah. race. Yeah. And, um, He's, I want to say he's won it five times. In my knowledge, he's never been there when he's won, which is hard for me to fathom. You know, you come up with a horse that's your grade two caliber in a 750000 <laughs> I just can't even imagine that. Because I remember when we went to the Mountaineer and Little Strike Impact won a, you know, like an $85,000 non-graded stakes race, and it was like the biggest thing <laughs> in the world. Um, there was certainly, I would... So just, uh, just, you know... It's all relative, isn't it? Jenny, go back on this race but behind Tapature. Certainly a good performance by Ulan Betor for uh, Ian Wilkes. Here. For Ian Wilkes' uh, Jenny? No? No, I think we dropped her. No, no, no she's still there. I, I can, I can, we can just barely hear her. Uh, Ulan Betor, which uh, is a... Uh, Somewhere in, in Mongolia, apparently. That 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 I, I found that out uh, this week uh, when I when uh, we were discussing this uh, on Friday, and somebody on Twitter uh, explained uh, the origins of Ulan Betor. Uh, this was a good performance, first stake opportunity for the Ian Wilkes uh, runner, and uh, I thought uh, Ulan Betor was was making progress steadily on the outside. I also thought that uh, this may have been an encouraging performance for the Sanfords, for Almost Famous. I think Jenny's back with us. Uh, Almost Famous is a horse, when he does not get the lead, he has been dreadful. He, he's 3-0 and when he gets the lead. He's off the board otherwise if he doesn't get the lead. He raided a little bit. He struck the front in this race. And he did stay on, credibly. He did not give up and pack it in and end up, you know, back of the pack. So this may have been a little bit more of an encouraging performance for, uh, uh, for everybody, Pat Byrne and the Sanfords, when it comes to Almost Famous. Jenny, are, yeah. you, are you there? There we go. I'm with you. I don't know what to make of that horse. He looked like he had a lot of horse, and, 
you know, maybe the other horses are just better. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see where all these horses go um, out of that race. Uh, you look back and there's some nice horses that certainly have come out of the of Matt win. No, um, yeah, this is always a he, juncture. He's a, a, he's juncture. a mystery horse to me. And Tapature, though, it did impress me because I wasn't sure what to make of him. He had won the Kentucky Jockey Club here, which didn't, in retrospect, look like a real strong race. Um, you know, and then he wins the Southwest, but then it's like a horse you kind of keep making excuses for. I think they sure did the right thing to people said, why wouldn't they go to the pre? Why wouldn't they? You know, they want to give them time to mature and everything. They did, you know, they're doing the right thing with the horse, and the payoff was yesterday, and, and the Winchells and, you know, Askerson, they're very realistic, and I think that they're not going to all of a sudden get Travers. Uh, fever, but if they think the horse deserves it, he'll be up there. But I would expect them to take sort of, like I said, the departing route, maybe go for the state derbies, with a lot of money to be made that yeah. way. Got to also talk about, you talk about making money. How about Dale Romans and Molly Morgan getting the money? This came in the floor to lead. Yeah. What, a, what a ride by Larry. Yeah, what a crafty I mean, just ride. Brilliant. Yeah. He, um, Dale liked her. He thought that she's one of those horses that's just like the, his his Philly, the same, uh, Bill Cubbage also uh, was a co-owner, and Philly a, a couple years ago won the Fall City. Um, just got better at the, you know, as she gotten older, and uh, he thought the distance was going to help, and it sure did, and it'll be interesting to see where she, where she goes. You know, I don't know <laughs> if she's ready for the the older Phillies that are in New York that we saw in the Bell Dame. Um, but, you know, he'll have her someplace where you know, she can get some more black type. And, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a big performance for sure. 97 buyer for Molly Morgan. So it does at least put her in the area code. Uh, I, I just do see a, a number, though, that came out. Uh, Aya Tappa, a 109 buyer in, in that race uh, in the vanity yesterday in California. I mean, a huge figure for her. But Molly Morgan, I thought Flashy American was going to be clever. The one horse that was just crazily overbet in here uh, was, was On Fire Baby. And yeah. Jenny, I, I mean, I love, I love On Fire Baby, Red Dog, Joe Johnson, Anita Cauley. But a mile and an eighth, I mean, at this point, you, they got to stop. They, she can't go a mile and an eighth. You called it on your, I was listening to your show, you know, previewing the stake. You called it. I was wanting to give her another chance. No. Look at, look at her three mile and eighth races. At Kentucky Oak, then she runs into Royal Delta at Saratoga and, you know, sort of tries to go with her and, you know, packs it in, understandable. And then on the synthetic at and the spinster when she was maybe, you know, she wasn't at her best. So I was ready, willing to give her one more shot. But let's face it, she can't go a mile and an eight. She's a wonderful filly, you know, and she, she's in, my husband's in the same barn as them. I see her, she's a big, strong filly. And, you know, you root for the story. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. But I, I'm thinking that she's now on the, uh, my Sean Bridgemahan, what I call my reserve list of people that in the future I will never write about until they win a race because it seems like when I do, then something happens. I remember writing about Bridgemahan one time when he had a big lead halfway through the meet and the rider standing at Churchill Downs and then he he got cold and Corey Lanner, he got hot and just blew right past him and, and uh, you know, so there's that. But then I also had I written about uh, uh, Moonshine... Mullen the morning of the Stephen Foster, then he wins. So, you know, it works both ways, and you know it really doesn't have anything to do with it. But I am sensitive that sometimes people don't want to take any chances. And so, like I said, on Fire Baby, next time I write about her, other than in sort of passing mention, will be when she wins a race. Jenny, always want to get an update whenever we talk to you. Strike Impact, the horse under your husband's care. You talked about him a little bit earlier. And uh, when I met up with you in the press box uh, for uh, Belmont Stakes, you mentioned his race at the end of uh, May. He had a nice second down there at Churchill. What's up next for Strike Impact? Yeah, well, we're trying to find something. There's nothing in the condition book at um, at Churchill, the rest of the meet. And there is a race at Arlington. So Pat was going to call the racing secretary. So, you know, if you want to put up an extra, you know, I'm going to enter in it. But we've got to run. And uh, um, and then he's got this other horse. This is terrible. He's got a horse he wants to run for 16000 You cannot get a straight 16000 going short to go. He entered him. Today for, um, I guess it's for Friday, two horses in. 
It doesn't go at Indiana Downs, which is 14th. That's the terrible state of racing right now. It is terrible. These races aren't going, and it's hard to keep. You know, you you can't blame owners if they, because if you claim a horse, you don't know that you can run it back. And it, so they make you either try to run them over their head, which doesn't do you any good if you can't make any money, or run them, you know, where you're giving them away. Um, just very, very, I've never seen it as bad as it is here, this meet. And I know Churchill is not the only place, but it is. And I think uh, some policies that they've been doing for 20 years have really hit home where a lot of the middle class is gone now. They're gone, and they're gone at training centers, and they're free agents, and they can run wherever they want to. They can get a trailer and go to Mountaineer. They can go to Valtau, formerly River Downs. They can go to Indiana Downs, but the races aren't necessarily going there either. So I don't know where these horses are. You can't tell me you can't get together six horses for 16000 going in short. It's, you know, I mean, I, I, when you see it with something like that, you know, you maybe you realize it more, and I'm and taking on this one you know, particular category, but that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you can't get the horses. I'm sorry you asked. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. It's interesting to hear the backstory on things like that. And we, we always have, uh, like, the, as I say, get the update on strike impact. So we'll root for you to get him he's in. He's doing great, though. He's like good training. He's doing great. All dressed up, just uh, needs a party to go to. <laughs> there you go. And again, he had that nice second right at the end of May. So uh, congratulations that's, that's on right. that. That's right. Yeah, when he was when he was second, and we had this big handicapping deal that day that the Courier Journal was putting on with Churchill Downs, and would have been too cool if I could have invited a hundred and something of my new best friends into the winner's <laughs> circle. But we were second, and and um, party school night party night party um, uh, one, and uh, John Asher liked that horse, and of course I liked Strike. So a whole bunch of New racing fans had an eighty-one dollar exact, oh, nice. so always good there. Very good, love it, Jenny. We got to wrap up. It's getting to the top of the hour, but as always, we appreciate talking to you. A little update on the action last night, big night at Churchill Downs, and we'll talk to you again. Sounds great. Jenny Reese from the Louisville Courier Journal, all of which wraps us up. Anything else you wanted to touch on? We, the fourth stake from last night it resulted in a disqualification, a little bit sassy. Michael Matz uh, gets taken down here, and. Uh, Wayne Catalano gets put up uh, with Aurelia's Bell, who finally had gotten over to the grass, and, and she had run a winning race. She, got, she basically got beat ahead, uh, and, but a little bit sassy, had cut off both Kiss Moon and uh, Aurelia's Bell. And Kiss Moon, right Kiss Moon down, that's the David Vance filly. She was making her grass debut as well. Kiss Moon isn't going to look all that good on paper. She's making a nice move. She's making got, a real yeah, nice move. Kiss Moon. Shot. And I tell you, that, that personal diary ran a very nice race for Vicki Oliver, who was a big price. Uh, the, uh, this was an interesting race, this regret. I would uh, go back and watch that. Uh, and there I, was a lot to learn from last I night. I just want to go back and mention Moonshine Mullins, because we talked about on the earlier show, too, that Randy Morse had said, go heading up to Saratoga, but don't want to meet Palace Malice. What are the other spots? And I wonder... You know, the Whitney's 1.5 million, so second in that race. Uh, so I'm wondering what, what he's going to decide to do with Moonshine Mullen because, uh, you know, where else can he go and why not take a shot for one and a half? That's a, you know, it's a fair question. Um, and we, I mean, we know obviously that, that he has run well at Saratoga. If you go back, I mean, he was sixth in that Travers, but he was, se you know, he was second at 37 to 1 in the Jim Dandy behind Stay Thirsty. He can shorten up a little bit. I mean, he, he can go a mile. So there's, there's probably, there'll probably be, uh, I'm trying to think of what is there. What is there for at, at a shorter uh, I don't know. At but a here, here we are. That was our uh, address. Loose on the lead at yahoo.com. We'd love to hear from you. Questions, comments, or suggestions, by all means, get in touch with us. That's going to wrap things up for this Sunday morning. We're every Sunday with Loose on the Lead, 10 until 11 a.m., so don't forget to tune in next week. Seth Merrow, Equidaily.com, Steve Bick of Sirius and XM's At the Races. You can catch it live online or on your Sirius XM radio or repeat it here next on day. Capital TV the next day. All right, that's going to wrap things up. Thanks for joining us this Sunday morning. Again, happy Father's Day. We'll see you next week. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.